We're now in week four of Clinical Microbiology 1, and we're starting a new group of organisms. And this group are the gram-negative cocci, or co uh, diplococci. And specifically, there are two genera that are in this group that are medically important. And they are Neisseria and Moraxella. This lecture has been broken down into five different parts. This is the first of five. Now, the gram-negative cocci have some two have two major families. There's the Neisseriaceae and there's the Moraxellaceae. Now, all of them, all of these organisms used to be in one family uh, at one point in time, but they've been broken out two distinct families, but they share very similar features. The genera that are in the Neisseriaceae family include the genus Neisseria, Kingella, Eichenella, Simonsiella, and Elysiella. The genera in the Moraxellaceae family include the genus Moraxella and the genus Acinetobacter. The pathogens in the gram-negative diplococci or cocci group are Neisseria gonorrhea, Neisseria meningitidis, and Neisseria, and, sorry, Moraxella cateralis. And these are the three organisms we're going to focus on in this lecture. There are some other organisms that are in the gram-negative cocci or diplococci group that are not considered pathogenic. So we won't focus on these organisms, but I will mention them. They are Neisseria cinera, Neisseria flavescens, Neisseria lactamica, Neisseria mucosa, Neisseria sicca, Neisseria subflava, Neisseria elong elongate, and Neisseria Weaveri. There's also Kingella denitrificans, and we will discuss Kingella as well as Acinetobacter in another lecture because they are actually small rods and not necessarily cocci. We're going to focus on the gram negative cocci in this lecture. The general characteristics of the organisms that are in the gram-negative cocci family, they are aerobic, they are non-modal, meaning they do not have flagella, they are non-spore forming, they are gram-negative, and these organisms are called diplococci. So they are cocci, but both Neisseria and Moraxella have two cocci that stick together, making them a diplococci. They are oxidase and catalase positive. Now, there are some differences in morphology and biochemical tests among some of the other organisms in this group. So the non-pathogenic Neisseria elongata and Neisseria weaveri, these are rod-shaped. Neisseria elongata is catalase negative. The Neisseria species are capnophilic. So they are aerobic organisms. Um, they do like some lower oxygen levels. So they grow better in a CO2 incubator than they do in ambient air, air especially some of the pathogenic organisms. The natural habitat of these organisms are the mucous membranes of the respiratory and neurogenital tracts. Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis are the major pathogens in this category of organisms. They're the, the big boys. Now, Neisseria gonorrhea is always considered a pathogen. If it is isolated from an ind individual, it's, it's, a, it's a pathogen. It is never normal flora. Whereas all of these other organisms in the gram-negative cocci category are considered to be human, um, normal human flora. Neisseria meningitidis 
is commensal flora of the upper respiratory tract and can be carried. Now remember, think back, there are some other pathogenic organisms that are carried, can be carried in the upper respiratory tract. One of the big ones that we discussed was Staphylococcus aureus. The pathogenic Neisseria species are fastidious organisms. They're a little more fussy. They like enriched media. Um, they Some of them will grow on regular laboratory blood agar, but especially Neisseria gonorrhea doesn't grow on blood agar. It needs a, a more enriched agar. It requires chocolate agar as well as some special selective media. So um, there is a requirement for iron among the pathogenic Neisseria organisms. They need iron for growth and metabolism. So you need to provide them media that contains high iron levels. So they do need a blood containing media to grow. The pathogenic Neisseria species are not going to grow very well on a typical nutrient agar based medium without any blood in it. Neisseria weaveri is a commensal in the upper respiratory tract of dogs and has actually been involved in human infections through dog bites. Now we've mentioned that some organisms are oxidase positive or catalase positive. We discussed the catalase test in detail when we were talking about the staphylococci and streptococci organisms because the catalase test is one of those first quick tests to differentiate those two genera. For the gram-negative organisms, the oxidase test is that nice initial quick test that is done that's going to allow you to narrow down your pool of possible organisms that might be causing an infection. So how you do an oxidase test in the lab, there, there are going to be different methods used depending on what laboratory you work in. But in general, you have either little disks or filter paper that contain the oxidase reagent. And when you smear one colony of your isolated organism growing on a plate onto this disk, it will react with the oxidase reagent and it will turn a purple, purpley blue color. So you will do this test very commonly in the lab in order to narrow down what your organism might be. We're going to start out like we always do with our, with our big organism, our highly pathogenic organism. And the Neisseria genus has two highly pathogenic species. So the first one we're going to talk about is gonorrhea, Neisseria gonorrhea. And of course, this is the causative agent of the disease gonorrhea, which is a sexually transmitted infection. And it used to be commonly known as the clap. So if someone said they had the clap, it meant that they had gonorrhea. Of course, since Neisseria gonorrhea is a pathogen, it does have virulence factors. So it has receptors for human transference, so it can up can get at that iron that it needs for growth. It has capsules which allow it to be antiphagocytic like we've mentioned many times. It has pili, those little protrusions that allow it to latch on to human uh, host cells. It can undergo antigenic variation where it can change the antigens on its outer surface so that our immune cells, our white blood cells, can't recognize it. When it finally recognizes the antigens on the outer surface and develops antibodies against the organism, the organism will then change or vary the antigens. So then the antibodies aren't useful anymore. So it's a very tricky way to evade the host immune system. Of course, it's a gram-negative organism, so it does produce lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin.
It produces um, protease, an IgA protease, which destroys the IgA1 immunoglobulin, and it produces beta-lactamase, which will make it penicillin-resistant, because penicillin has a beta-lactam ring, and that beta-lactamase will um, not allow penicillin to work. The pathogenesis of Neisseria gonorrhea is that it attaches to the host epithelial cells and then it gets into the cells and then spreads throughout the submucosa. It generates an acute inflammatory response. The organism um, generates an, an immune response which leads to inflammation. It gets can get into the bloodstream and it can lead to a disseminated gonococcal infection. This organism has a very short incubation period of about two to seven days. So within two two days to a week after being infected, an individual may start to develop symptoms. Neisseria gonorrhea causes a variety of infections. It can cause genital infections, rectal, pharyngeal. It can lead to pelvic inflammatory disease in females. It can cause a disseminated infection, get into the bloodstream, and it can also cause conjunctivitis or an eye infection. So we'll start out with the more common genital gonorrhea, like I said, also known as the clap. In males, genital gonorrhea causes a, an acute urethritis. There is a pussy discharge that will come out of the um, male urethra, and it can cause dysuria or painful when you urinate. If the organism ascends up from the urethra into the deeper areas of the body, it can become a very complicated infection. In females, genital gonorrhea is an endocervical infection. It sometimes causes vaginal discharge, maybe an, an increase in frequency in wanting to urinate. However, the problem with gonorrhea in women is the symptoms are so mild that they're usually not noticed and they could be completely absent. So at least half of gonorrhea infections in females are completely asymptomatic. The problem with that is there are two problems. One problem is that the individual doesn't know they have an infection and they don't go in for treatment, so it ends up to be a much more complicated infection that can lead to pelvic inflammatory disease. The other problem is, of course, that the individual isn't getting treated and doesn't know they have an infection and can then spread that infection to numerous other people. Rectal gonorrhea is an infection commonly due to rectal intercourse, due to contamination with infected secretions. Usually, this is an asymptomatic infection. It can cause rectal bleeding. Pharyngeal gonorrhea is due to oral genital um, intercourse. It is usually asymptomatic it can lead to a chronic sore throat. Pelvic inflammatory disease is that complication that commonly occurs in female genital gonorrhea where the disease extends from the endocervix into the fallopian tubes. Usually the person will get endometriosis and peritonitis, possibly a low-grade fever. They'll have a chronic lower abdominal pain. And the problem with pelvic inflammatory disease is it can cause so much scarring in that area that the individual commonly becomes infertile. So they, they will not be able to have any children. Another complication that uh, tends to happen with gonorrhea is it can disseminate from 
any of the local sites of infection, it can get into the bloodstream and cause a bacteremia, bacteria in the blood. Symptoms of disseminated infection include a rash. It can cause endocarditis or the infection of the, end, or the lining around the heart. It can lead to meningitis. It can cause an arthritis. So this disseminated infection can cause very severe chronic and life-threatening illnesses. Now, Neisseria gonorrhea can cause conjunctivitis, just a typical eye infection, and it can also cause ophthalmia neonatorum. And what this is, is the organism gets in introduced into the eyes of a newborn baby. Usually this happens during birth. So as the baby is traveling through the birth canal of an infected mother, the mother who, uh, mother who has genital gonorrhea and maybe doesn't even know it, the organism gets into the eyes during delivery and the baby is born with and will event ultimately develop a very purulent or pussy, oozy eye infection. And it, this could cause blindness. So this organism is not a commensal organism. So think about it. Most of the other organisms we've discussed so far are commensal organisms or normal flora somewhere on the body, whether it's the skin, the upper respiratory tract, the mucous membranes, the genital tract, the GI tract. A lot of our organisms that cause infection are actually normal flora. And it's up to us as medical laboratory scientists to figure out if this is just our typical normal flora that we're seeing growing where it should be growing, or has it caused an infection in this individual? Well, Neisseria gonorrhea is not in that category. If you isolate Neisseria gonorrhea from an individual, that individual has an infection, period. There is no normal flora of Neisseria gonorrhea in or on our bodies unless we have an infection. Transmission most commonly is direct transmission through sexual intercourse. And there's also vertical transmission from the mother to the baby in utero. It is incredibly difficult to control gonorrhea because so many people that have it do not have any, any symptoms and are not getting treated for it and are then spreading it and they don't even know it. Over the years, Neisseria gonorrhea has shown a decrease in its susceptibility to antibiotics. So it's like many organisms, it has become increasingly antibiotic resistant. And one prevention and control strategy is to have education programs, promoting safe sex, handing out free condoms at clinics and things of that nature. In the laboratory, in order to diagnose Neisseria gonorrhea, you would want to do an oxidase test and make sure that the organism is oxidase positive, the little disc where you add your oxidase region and the, or it turns purple. You can do some morphology and staining of the organism. So a direct smear of pus from a male urethra if you find gram-negative diplococci in that smear, usually you'll see intracellular organisms. So you're going to see a lot of white blood cells in that um, male urethral pus discharge. You're going to see a lot of diplococci intracellularly in that specimen. That would be indicative of a gonorrhea infection in that individual. Another test that can be done is uh, carbohydrate utilization. So there used to be a test called CTA carbohydrates. It has since been taken off the market, but 
when we put our organisms into our machines, our machines now do our tests for us. So the Microscan, the Vitec, and they are doing these carbohydrate utilization and fermentation tests so that they can, the machine can figure out what this organism is, just like we used to do manually with our individual carbohydrate tube tests. So the CTA sugar tests, and there are other tests that are very similar that have taken its place if you were to do a manual test. Usually these require about 24 to 72 hours because you have to first grow up your organism. You then have to take single colonies because you need a pure culture. You need to grow the possibly grow the organism in broth and dilute it and inoculate all of these different tube medias and then incubate those overnight. So it, it can be a, a labor intensive process, which is why they're commonly not done anymore. Now there is a test called rapid and the rapid tests and they make the rapid tests for all of the organisms. But the rapid test for the Neisseria is a carbohydrate degradation test and it's read in two to four hours. So here's the old-fashioned way where you had a test tube with one carbohydrate in it. And so you would have to do individual test tubes um, testing for each sugar. So you'd have a tube with glucose, a tube with maltose, a cute tube with lactose, a tube with sucrose, add your organism to it, incubate it overnight, and then see if there was a color reaction in the test tube. If there is a color reaction, it means that the organism utilized the sugar in that test tube lowered the pH in the test tube and the lower low pH turns the media from an orangey red color to a yellow color. So um, that's how it used to be done years ago. Now there's these little rapid tests and the, even the rapid tests aren't done as often in the clinical lab. You might do a rapid test in the clinical lab if you're quite certain an individual had a specific organism and the microscan or the Vitac, whatever the big instrument is that's being used in the laboratory that you're working in, if it's not coming up with that organism and you're saying something is not quite right here, you might then go to your manual um, testing such as the rapid kit which is a two to four hour test. Some of the other lab tests that can be done there's something called a super oxal test. This is very similar to the catalase test but with the catalase test we use three percent hydrogen peroxide your typical peroxide that you can get in the in the drugstore. This test uses 30% hydrogen peroxide and Neisseria gonorrhea produces a very vigorous immediate bubbling response when it's in the when it gets hit with the 30% hydrogen peroxide and of course you can do your molecular based nucleic acid tests where you're detecting the gonococcal antigen or the nucleic acid directly in the cervical, urine, or urethral exudates. And you can also use non-amplified as well as amplified probe methodologies. Now we said that Neisseria gonorrhea is becoming increasingly resistant to antibiotics and this is due to a plasmid mediated penicillinase. So we have plasmid mediated penicillinase producing Neisseria gonorrhea or PPNG. Now what this is is it's Neisseria gonorrhea that has taken in a plasmid. If you remember, the plasmid is a circular self-replicating piece of DNA. Neisseria gonorrhea takes in this plasmid and in this plasmid there's a gene that allows the organism to produce the enzyme penicillinase which will break down penicillin thus making the organism resistant to penicillin. It also exhibits chromosomal mediated resistance, so it has a, a PEN-R gene in its chromosome. 
So between the plasmid and the chromosome mediated resistance to penicillin, also it has plasmid and chromosomal mediated resistance to tetracycline and fluoroquinolones. So the organism, again, has become increasingly resistant to more and more antibiotics as it takes in new plasmids with different resistance genes and enzymes. So now we're going to move on to the second part of our gram-negative cocci lecture.